What I want to talk about is meeting the nutritional needs on pasture. And one of the things I want to start with is the conclusion of what I'm going to talk about here. One of the things you need to understand as we put together a grazing system, and it is a system, you bring different components together to actually come and get what you want in the end. And the key is, if we look at ex excellent pasture managers, it doesn't make any difference what species that they manage. One of the key things is that you see in these managers is that they are able to integrate forage management and animal management or animal practices together. Because we want to take a crop as in forages and be able to produce a, an animal that we can market for economic purposes. And so it's an integration there that's very important. So as we go through the next two days, I want you to think about how do you integrate the forage component with the animal component to get to the result that you're after. Because that's basically what you're trying to do as you're putting this system together. So what I want to do in this presentation is go through some key concepts. I put together six different concepts here. For some of you, these may seem very simplistic, but if you think back of how you manage a system, these are some of the key concepts that you practice as you put together that system and you make sure that system works from day to day. Because one of the things that's really important when you put together a grazing system, is that feedback? That better? No. That better? Okay. Because that feedback, I've, I heard it before. One of the things you want to do when you put that system together is making sure that all these concepts fit together. And one of the things that's important is, is making sure we practice these particular concepts. So let's start with concept number one. Forage factors regulate intake. Intake is one of the key things when we look at managing animals. And it doesn't make any difference what animal it is. It can be um, at home, dog and a cat. Intake is important on that animal. Making sure that if it is a maintenance animal, you don't feed it too much. But if it's an animal that is growing, and really we're dealing with growing animals when we have them out on pasture, is how do we get intake into these animals, especially high performance animals, because that's what I deal with, high performance animals um, out there. Stalkers are no different than a dairy cow. Both of them, you're looking to put product on the table. In a dairy cow, it's milk. In a stalker animal, it's weight gain or beef. So various forage factors do regulate intake. And this is a classic diagram that if you've been to any extension presentations, you've seen it multiple, multiple times. But there are very much key components here that as we see grasses and legumes mature from a vegetative state, leafy state, to a reproductive state, what we see is obviously yield increases in that particular plant if we were to go out there and harvest it. But the key thing from an animal standpoint is that as that plant matures, the intake of that plant by that animal decreases as it matures. If we're dealing with a part of the life cycle of that animal where intake is the most important, we want to make sure that we are putting those animals on that pasture when it is more vegetative than maybe another time in that animal's life cycle. We still want to be more up and through here, though, when we're managing a grazing system. The reason why it's important is, is as that plant matures, the digestibility in that cow, in that animal's rumen, it could be a sheep or a cow, it decreases. And therefore, that animal gets less energy out of it and therefore you get less performance out of that animal. 
That is the reason why we harp and we talk about how do we keep these pastures vegetative. We're trying to get intake into these animals, and we're trying to get energy into these animals. We want to make them the most productive they can be. So that is one of the key concepts and the reason why we talk about vegetative um, components. This is a table that um, we, Jeff and I put together that looks at different species and different um, components and the importance of the actual maturity of that forage. So if we take for an example a beef cow, that beef cow when it's vegetative they're going to eat about two and a half to three percent of their body weight on a dry matter basis. So what is dry matter basis? What is dry matter intake? Does anyone know what dry matter intake is? Mm -hmm. How much that animal would eat if we took all the water out of their feet? And as nutritionists, we always look at it on a dry matter basis. So we can compare intake of one animal to intake of another animal and eating different types of forages. So we always do it with all the water out of it. Okay? So if we look at this, we see that basically at vegetative state, they eat about two and a half to three percent of their body weight. As that plant matures, they eat less. Same as I showed in that other diagram, but putting numbers on there. That basically um, we go from two and a half to three percent of body weight down to one and a half to two percent of body weight with mature forage, that that has a head on it. So as that forage matures, they eat less of it. And as they eat less of it, we get less performance unless we actually have enough energy coming into that animal with it for that life cycle. Same is true with stalkers or any other animal that you want to put in there. The numbers there that may change a little bit, but the concept is there. As that plant matures, the animal eats less of it because it stays in the room and longer. Therefore, he or she can eat less of it. That is the bottom line. One of the things that we need to make sure that when we calculate how much pasture we need, and we're going to go through these calculations in the next presentation, is when we're dealing with a cow-calf operation, you, only ha you have a cow, but you also have a calf on that cow. And obviously that calf does eat um, feed there. So we have to take that into account. One of the things that's important to understand that as we estimate dry matter intake or how much those animals will eat, it determined by forage maturity, which we've talked about, but it also depends on the age or size of that animal. Bigger animals eat more than little animals. Um, but the thing is, you've got to take that into account um, when you actually look at how much do you have to give them in a day's time or three days time or a week's time or 10 days time, how much pasture you give them um, the, the age or the size of that animal is important. Also, the expected animal performance. If you want to get three pounds of gain on a stalker, you've got to give them more pasture because you want to leave more behind so you can get higher quality into that animal. So expected animal performance also impacts dry matter intake there. When we get into other species, obviously these concepts also follow through. There are some differences there as far as different species, but pretty much the same type of concepts there. So key things, we want to keep it vegetative. You're going to hear this over and over and over again the next two days, and you're going to get, so you don't want to hear that word anymore. But trying to keep it vegetative, moving those animals quick enough to keep it vegetative and so that when they come back around again, um, basically it will also be vegetative. One of the things to understand that as we look at how quickly we rotate these animals, it's going to be dependent on not only the animal needs, but also the growth of the forage. Remember I talked about it's the integration. In the springtime, we have very rapid growth of grasses and legumes. 
So if we look at the speed of rotations in the springtime, they may be every two to three weeks. Whereas we get later in that season and that plant doesn't grow as fast, it may be at 30 to 40 days. One of the things you're going to understand as we go through here, there is no one recipe to making a grazing system work. And you have to modify as you go. And it doesn't make any difference if your first year you're grazing or like the gentleman in the back who's done it for 40 years, he modifies every year. There is not, I guarantee you, there is not a year he is doing exactly the way he did it a previous year in the 40 years. Weather patterns change. What is out there for grasses change. He may change a little bit of the age of that animal out there. There are all differences there. And those are important as we look at putting together this system. And understanding those differences is how you manage that system. So we want to make sure a lot of times we'll talk about it's more, it's better to start grazing earlier versus too late. If you want to err on one side, you want to be too early versus too late. We're going to talk about the, what I call the Q-squared concept, forage concept. And when we're talking about forages, we talked about the importance of quality, getting the intake of that animal. And now we're going to talk about what quantity and how quantity is important. Now, Ray told me that I could consume any feed up here that I deemed I wanted. Oh, he watered these. Oh, boy. All right, we got a crop here, and this is a serious question. How does a cow eat grass? And no, Jimmy, you cannot laugh at me. Jimmy has laughed at me now for 25 years. Excuse me? He's actually physically eats. How does she physically eat? Okay, assume this, my two fingers is my tongue. I'm a cow. So basically, I take my tongue and I wrap it around. I snip it off. Remember, I don't have upper teeth. I just have lower teeth. I snip it off and I eat, correct? So how much can I get in my tongue, the grass that is tall, versus when I take this down? He said I could eat. He's got some tough grass here. All right, so as I am up top, when I have taller grass, I can eat a lot quicker, can I? I can get a lot more in my, quote, mouth. And I put it on my back, too? Yeah, oh, yes, you got you to throw it because that, that horse fly is coming to get you. So as that grass is taller, Obviously, I got a lot more. Now, how, as it gets down closer here, how much can I get in my mouth? Not very much, right? So we talk about that height of that grass and the importance of it. One of the things you're going to hear as we talk about grasses is we want to put them on, the animals on when it's about 10 inches tall and take them off when it's 3 to 4 inches. So I want you to think about how much you can get in your mouth. Just think of your yard and how you mow it, and how when it gets down close, if, if your horse got out there, how much could they eat type deal. And that is, we're going to do my clicker now. And that is what is illustrated here in this concept. So if we look at this particular graph here, and we look at cattle eating here, and we see that basically as the available forage increases in that pasture, there's an increase in intake, and then it levels off. And it levels off here roughly, if I can come down, about 2,000 pounds per acre. Okay? And over the years, basically on grasses, and I love easy math, I call it pickup truck math, and if we assume that there's about 200 pounds of dry matter per acre, 
So if we take our 200 pounds of dry matter per inch, excuse me, I got the wrong units. And so if we take 2,000 divided by 200, what do we get? 10. 10 inches. Basically, we maximize our intake when we're about 10 inches in that grass. So usually it's about 8 to 10 inches tall, and then we take them off when it's 3 to 4. Now, we had some people in here that had sheep. How do sheep eat? All the way to the bottom. Basically, they got a cleft, and they can actually come down and eat closer. See, basically they can eat closer here. There's a little difference in intake of those animals, and basically those animals actually can um, eat down a lot closer. So we're going to have to worry about, from the standpoint of growth of that grass, that we don't want them to eat too much down too closely because we want that grass to regrow. So we're trying to manage those animals and the forage and integrate those two together. So it's a little bit different concept here. So realize, and we're going to come back and talk about this, this is probably one of the areas that managers forget when it comes to summertime. Realize that grazing time and biting rate are relatively constant. Bite size varies by the amount of forage available, and it affects how much they can eat. Think about that height. If we come over here and you look at this, I can actually eat quite a bit out of here. I can get quite a bit, but when it gets down too low, I can't eat very much. So think about when you look at pastures, think about if you were a cow, how much would you be able to consume? So maximum intake occurs when it's about 1,800 to 2,000 pounds of dry matter per acre. And basically, that forage height is usually about 6 to 10 inches. So that comes back and talks about why um, some of the recommendations that we have. The quantity of forage available, the grazing height, influences intake and performance. We're after performance. So we don't want to turn them in too soon, but we don't want to turn them in too late. Because it's a balancing there of that system of quality versus quantity. The concept we often think about when we're going through and designing this system is we use half and we leave half. That's really hard for people when they start grazing to understand. You've got to leave some leaf area behind for the plant. So basically, we're going to use about half of it and we're going to leave half. So we want to leave, past, leave some forage behind, and we don't want to leave those animals in there too long that they graze that forage down so that it cannot regrow as quickly as it can. So we're usually talking about utilize, utilization rates around 50 to 60 percent, not 90 percent plus. Okay, And it varies by the type of the operation. Um, and life cycle that that animal is at. Well, how much we're going to leave behind. Now, after we have frost, do grasses regrow? So basically, you take it or you lose it. So use it or lose it type concept. So after frost, it's not going to regrow. We can take it all the way down. Okay? So concept number two and we go through these faster as we go through. The life cycle of cattle influences its nutritional needs. So if we're talking about a cow-calf operation, obviously milk production is important here. The higher producing cow has greater nutrient needs than the one that is lower producing. When are they higher producing? Shortly after they have their calf, right? Versus a little bit later. So when we think about it from a standpoint is that first three months after calving, her nutrient needs are higher. We're going to have to rotate quicker during that time than later. OK? So again, how we design and manage the system is determined not just by the forage out there. 
It's determined by an integration of forage and the needs of that animal, whatever that animal is. Now, when we talk about how many of you have spring calving herds, there was a lot of cow calf. How many are fall calving? Quite a few, good. All right, spring calving herd. When is that cow in early lactation? What month? Early lactation, first three months. March, April, usually we have pretty good grass growth, correct? Okay, now fall calving herd, when is that animal with the greatest needs? October, November. When do we get most of our grass growth? In the spring. So we got to make sure that we have a system set up that we can meet the nutrient needs of that animal when it's in early lactation. Now, the second most important time is when? Just before they calve. And if you're a dairy person, we're going to say that's the most important time. How you treat that animal, we know in dairy in particular, and beef cows are no different than a dairy cow. It's just a lot of things you don't see. We know in a dairy cow what, how, what we do to that animal the, that month before she calves and two to three weeks after she calves determines how well she does the whole rest of the year. So let's talk about that spring, that fall calving herd. When is she dry, or just before she has her calf, that last trimester, sorry, I'm using dairy terms. When is that last trimester of that beef cow? What month? August and September. Let's take August. What happens in August in a normal year? It's hot and not a lot of rain. What happens to forage growth? It dries up. What does that animal have to eat? You've got to be making sure that they get the intake into that animal. This is how life cycle of that animal and management of forage come together. So that last three months of pregnancy is greater than the middle trimester of that animal. And you've got to think about that and what's out there for that animal to eat. Don't think that just because that animal is not lactating or not producing milk, that its needs are not there. And if we have sheep, it's even more important or as important that, and that time before they have their young. That is a very critical time period that we probably didn't really understand um, back quite a few years ago. We do now in the importance of that. Okay, speeding up. Need to make sure we talk about that calf. That calf does consume feed. Basically, that calf relies on its mother for nutrients on a cow-calf, usually that first three months, and then it needs um, forage there to sustain itself. High-performance animals. Realize that those animals, get, if we want them to gain three pounds, two and a half pounds, they have higher nutrient needs than if they gain a pound and a half. And basically, that animal will determine gain based on how well we manage it. Cows do selectively graze. Um, they will graze higher quality forage. Um, they will select different species. They have preferences. And those are going to be different than if we went out there and we did it with pasture clippings. Because they will selectively graze different components of that. And that's one of the things that if you watch those animals, you will sort of see what your animals prefer as far as crops are concerned. So selective grazing, higher than pasture clippings. The other thing is, and, and she mentioned this earlier, that animal eats from the top down. So. With the grass, it's leaves. When we're talking about clover or alfalfa, 
That animal eats from the top down. So, again, my cow. That first time I come in with my tongue, what do I get? Leaves. What do I get the second time? Leaves and stems. The next time, he, he got a tall plant for me this time. Now, if I can actually get it off, it's a lot more stem than I got this last time. And realize that if we're leaving that animal, let's say we've got alfalfa out there, because you're going to go out and see alfalfa. The same type of concept, leaves, leaves and stem, stem. If we leave them out there three to five days, what, they're going to get different nutrition throughout that time frame. So if we're dealing with a dairy herd, and butter fat is real important, and consistency is so important, same with the stock or any, um, though, you want consistency there, we're going to take and give them a narrower area so they eat that whole plant at, at one feeding versus eating different components. And that's one of the reasons why we will use, um, and also we're bringing animals in and out, so it's a lot easier because we're moving them anyways, is we will give them a, a smaller area to eat and eat it down. It's consistency of feed, and also we're coming in and out there anyways. Um, milking those cows twice a day. So, but it's real important there when we get into um, alfalfa plants. Speed up here. So, forage species determines intake and performance. Another key concept. We're going to talk about, the agronomists are going to talk about adding clover to grass stands. Add clover to grass stands. And they're going to talk about fixing nitrogen and how fixing nitrogen is very important for that plant, well it is. But the one thing you get also is as you add legumes, you increase forage intake and what that animal gets out of it, the digestibility. It's a double whammy there. So it's an integration there of forage and animal performance that we're after by adding that legume into that rotation. Concept number five is we want quality and quantity of forage available at all times for that animal making sure that when we rotate those animals and how quickly we rotate those animals is determined by what is there. So when we talk about growth of grasses and designing a system, we need to be cognizant of those times where we have more forage than we need and times when we do not have enough forage for those particular animals. And designing this system and making this system actually work there. And as we build this system, it's important to think about those critical times and what other forage species we can bring in to cover those critical times. So we use a variety of forages to get that quality and quantity into those animals at all times. There are two times that are very critical, summertime, Grasses don't like to grow, especially cool season grasses do not grow when it's above 75 degrees. And most time in August, it is above 75 degrees. And late fall. So these are two times we think about and needing um, to get different crops involved so that we can have that quality and quantity there. And so this is when we will come in with different species and build that system over time. It's not something you do tomorrow, it's something that you build over time. So essentially when you get to that 10 year time frame that Ray talked about at the beginning for that gentleman, is that you would have a system that you have quality forage in there, maximize how many animals that you can have on that particular land or meeting your goals of that particular land resource with those animals, but having different crops so that you can have forage there available for those animals based on normal type of growth. Concept number six. This is the most important concept I'm going to talk about here, and it is the most violated concept of all. The time spent grazing does not increase on poor quality pastures. Essentially, your cow goes to work, or your sh sheep goes to work. They work their eight hours. When that time frame is over, 
They go home, so to speak. It doesn't make any difference if they got done with their job or not. They go home. So if they don't have the quantity or the quality, total quality that they need, getting the amount of energy they need, the amount of protein they need, they say, tough crap, I'm going to give you the performance that you gave me, and you're going to take it. They'll maintain themselves, hopefully. Um, if you don't, you got other issues. But they're not going to give you the performance that you're really after there. So the key is that they spend about eight or nine hours a day grazing. And you could argue, is it eight, is it nine, is it ten? I don't care. The key thing is there's a set time frame, and they don't extend it because we don't provide them what they need. So they're going to spend about the same amount of time grazing regardless of pasture quality or yield. And this seems extremely simple, and a lot of people are going, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. How many people violate it, though? We'll ask the agents here, especially the newer agents, in uh, about uh, a two years' time frame, how many violate this. And I guarantee you um, they'll, have, it, they'll be out of the dozen <laughs> uh, of those that they could cite that violate this. So, bottom line, the nose of that steer, cow, calf, sheep, or goat has to be in contact with green, leafy, in other words, vegetative forage at all times to get the performance we're after. And realize it is an integration of forages and animal performance that makes a grazing system work. You can be a great forage manager. If you can't manage the animals with it, you're not a good grazing manager. And the same as vice versa can work. The key is, is how do we bring the two of those together? So, questions? Um. Warm season grasses are an entirely different type of crop, and I'm going to let the agronomists, they're going to talk about this quite a bit later. But cool season grasses, basically, it's, it's the biochemistry in the plant that makes them a cool season grass versus a warm season grass. Mm -hmm. You can do that. It depends what you're trying to do. That's not as uh, it's not as simple as that. Um, let Let's answer that. How about we answer that question at the end of the two days? I think I think you'll get your answer over time. I think, yeah, but cool season grasses and warm season grasses, they, they have different biochemistry that makes them different. And they grow during di different time frames. Temperature is the, the easiest way for the nutritionists to understand. I had. So, um, my sheep, I got them from a lady that had too much season grass. I have a lot of legumes, John Deere grass. Yes, putting on too much weight in any animal is a concern if they are truly putting on. Now realize with a sheep, you've got wool there. So you've got to account, okay, but you still got to account for the coat. Let's call it coat. Um, so you still got to make sure you account for that coat that you're actually looking at body Con, what we call body condition on that animal. An animal that is over conditioned has more issues after they have their young. So how, how can you slow them down on 
you're going to have to do it by quality or pulling them off or you're going to have to manage it through. Yeah, that's a very uh, no. Well, there is some there is some energy animals will eat to meet their energy needs, but we see that in a lot of times in those dry you know, before they have their young, they will consume more feed. Um, one of the things um, we will control energy intake is the big thing. It's not protein, it's more energy. Um, control that energy intake there is one of the key things. Um, and we can talk about that. Yeah, yes, the carbs. Basically, you got to control carbs. Well, it's this whole plan. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about Yes. Well, you can do it with, yeah, you can, uh, you can do it with dual species. You could also do it with a species by putting a higher performance animal on first versus a low, and then follow behind with a lower performance animal. That is one way you can do, you could do it either way. But basically what you do here is you will rotationally graze, but the first animals that go into the paddock are those that have the highest nutrient needs is usually leader follower, um, there, there's some other terms that are used for that. Is that what you're asking? And so basically you would put the highest performance animals in first and then the lower performance animals in second or those that would eat down further. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Personally, I would run them after cattle because they're going to eat. They like to eat. You're going to see a picture next time. They eat up. Right. Yes, they eat, and they are going to eat some species that the cattle probably do, we don't want them eating. Um, Now, you're talking maintenance type goats, or are you talking wanting high performance on these goats, or what? Just, just, just a clean up, basically clean up fence rows, that kind of thing is what you're looking for. See, the fence rows, how do you classify utilization? Yeah. Basically, you are going to increase utilization. If you put an animal behind that has lower performance needs, they, as long as you keep that three to four inches for pasture regrowth, you're going to get increased utilization. That first species that goes in, you're not going to utilize. You probably will, you will take it, just take the tops off. And then the second one's going to come in. So utilization will go up. As far as an amount, I've never seen an amount on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as long as the life cycle is that that the cat that the cattle on in mid trimester and then the sheep are have their young on them, or just before they have their young. Yeah, you got to watch that. And that's a very good point. One of the things that, that is often done is we, we talk about creep grazing, is letting basically have that fence up just a little bit higher that the calf goes under or the young go under, and basically they can get the, eat the tops of the plants or the best part of the plants. Um, so that's a concept that we also use. Well, if, I, I'm thinking 50 to 55 or 50 to 60. I'm not going to 90. No, we we need to probably take off that 90 off the table. Yeah, let's take the 90 off the table. Um, so your goal as a, as a raising pasture manager is not to increase utilization of the pasture necessarily. 
it's, yeah, you, you do utilize it, more of it from rotational grazing versus continuous grazing, but yeah, you're still going to use about half of it, plus or minus. We'll talk, we'll talk more about that, but what we are assuming, uh, particularly with our cool season forages, that, that 